but I'm not born as a Christian. Mary, she makes a personal decision, makes many personal decisions all throughout the story. She made a personal decision to leave the kitchen and go to the dining room. She made a personal decision to risk her reputation by approaching Jesus, even though women weren't supposed to be at the table where men were hanging out and having their God time. She made a personal decision to take the posture of a servant and kneel at Jesus' feet. Then she made the personal decision to break the bottle of perfume, pour it, and again, the personal decision to let down her hair and wash Jesus' feet with it. You've got to make a personal decision to trust Jesus. Jesus. Your mom can't save you. Your dad can't save you. Your grandpa, nobody. I can't save you. Your pastor, nobody can make that decision for you. It's a decision that you make. So the question <laughs> is, have you made that decision? Have you personally trusted Jesus, asked him to save you from your sin and repent it? It's as simple as asking Jesus to save you from your sin and to take control of your life. But that's a personal decision you have to make. No one Living or dead can make that decision for you. True conversion is always personal. Secondly, it's passionate. Now, when I say passionate, don't think about romantic passion. It's not, we're not talking about the, like the sort of love or romantic passion. That's not what passion doesn't, it doesn't always mean that. The word passion means a willingness to suffer or to sacrifice. So to suffer or sacrifice for someone. Mary, we see it here. She's passionate about Jesus. Doesn't mean she has this romantic inclination towards him, but it means she's willing to sacrifice and suffer because he's Lord. What did she sacrifice? Well, we just see this bottle of expensive perfume. What, what does that really mean? Like we have again, we have no context for that in America in 2024. So she had this perfume again, it was worth 300 denarii, which would have been about one year's wages. So we're going to say conservatively, just to put it in our language. We'll say this was worth $40,000. That's, that's conservative, okay? You're like, a bottle of perfume was worth $40,000? Why did, was she rich? Only rich people are gonna have a bottle of $40,000 perfume, right? Not at all. So what happened in that day was when a girl got to a certain age, her dad would give her a gift. It was called a dowry or a bride price. And then that was hers to keep. It was something of tangible value that she had. And then when she would get married, parents would arrange marriages. And then when they would get married, she would bring that item, that value, whatever it was, into the marriage. Sometimes it would be cattle. Sometimes it would be money. And I believe what this was, was this was her gift that her dad gave her. It was this bottle of incredibly expensive perfume. Now here's where we learned some details about marriage. She still had this. She, this was in her possession. If a woman didn't get married by about the age of 18 in this culture, it kind of became a question if she was going to get married at all. And then some panic would start to set in because if you're not married by the time you're 18, it's ch the chances are slim to none that you might not get married at all. So if you're not going to get married at all, then you're not going to have kids and this panic, whatever, this panic would sit in. So you're going to be alone. So Mary was given this gift. She's still not married. So that means she might never get married. So when she gets old, there's not going to be anyone to take care of her. So she's not going to have anything. But what she does have is this perfume. And what does she do with this perfume? Well, later in life, if she's old, she's alone. She has no kids, she has nobody to take care of her, she can't really take care of herself anymore. She's got a $40,000 item that she can sell. And she can use that to buy food, pay for living, continue to live, because this is some money that she has set aside in preparation for that day. But what does she do with it? She breaks it and pours it on Jesus' feet. What Mary is saying here is that Jesus, my my financial security, my retirement, my wealth, my, my bank account, my riches, everything I have, none of that is worth anything compared to knowing you. Her entire sense of security was born in one act of incredible worship. That's passion. She's giving it all in that moment. She realizes she may only have one chance to do something extravagant for Jesus 
she's all in. She's not trying to figure out, is this the Lord? Is it not? Do I believe him? Do I not? What it, is, it, is he really God? No, she's all in. She just threw her entire future security on this. She believed that true conversion is always personal and it's passionate. The third is public. Remember, it's personal, it's not private. It's public. Our faith must affect our public life. Did you notice when she breaks open this perfume, what did it say happened to the house? The whole house filled with the aroma of it. Everybody in there knew what was happening. They knew what was going on. They sit, they could smell it. They smelled this act of worship was happening. Judas criticizes her. Jesus defends her. So when we when we convert, when we place our faith and our trust in Jesus, people are going to notice. There should be there should be some aroma in our lives that says. There's something different about that person. That person is a Jesus follower. And I'm not talking about being an obnoxious Christian that stands on the corner with a sandwich board sign, screaming through a megaphone that yells, turn and burn. Like, that's not going to do anything to anybody. I've never seen anybody come to faith like that. You're not going to talk people into Jesus by yelling at them from a street corner. But your faith should always be public. That's... How you live out your faith in public is, is being generous and nice to people who are rude to you. Not making fun of the kid that other kids are making fun of. Not passing judgment on people. Going out of your way to include people who are isolated. But there's living a certain way. But when we talk about having faith in Jesus and spreading the gospel, you have to use words too. You have to speak the gospel. Just, I know a lot of really nice people that aren't Christians. You can't, you can't be nice enough to somebody that they, that, that they accept Jesus just because you stubbed your toe and you didn't cuss. I, you have to speak words. There's a quote. Uh, nobody really knows who says it. Um, somebody, there's an old uh, church kind of pastor, theologian named Francis of Assisi. Some people are credited to him. I don't think it was him because uh, he was actually very outspoken. But there's a quote that says... Um, uh, preach the gospel always. Use words if necessary. Has anybody heard that? Preach the gospel always. Use words if necessary. That is a trash statement. That is, you don't, that's, that's, not, that's like saying, feed the poor always. Use food if necessary. If you want to feed somebody, you've got to use food. <coughs> if you want to point people to Jesus and have them know Jesus, you've got to use words. Here's what I want to say. Uh, we're going to do a little participation right now. If you are saved, you know you've given your life to Jesus, I want you to raise your hand. All right. This is a beautiful picture of boldness right now. You can put your hand down. Because I want you to understand that living for Jesus is going to be tough. It's not always going to be easy. And if you won't raise your hand in here, when I ask you that question, what makes you think you're going to be bold out there? Your faith is personal, but it's not private. It is public. I've been uh, now, I think, to 13 countries. I've been all over the world. I've been blessed to travel a lot. I got to see a lot of things. And just a few months ago, I was in Morocco. Love Morocco. Beautiful country. Incredibly nice people. But when I landed in Morocco, I got off the plane, went to the airport. And in the airport, there was a currency exchange kiosk. So I walked over to this currency exchange kiosk. I took my American dollars out, slid in under this little thing to the sky behind the glass. This nice, very nice Moroccan gentleman. He took my dollars, looked at the exchange chart, pulled mine aside, and then handed me back uh, Moroccan uh, durum to the car. So he handed me a bunch of durum. That's, that's conversion. When you take something old, give it to somebody, and they convert it into something new. <clears throat> When you know what Jesus did for you, when you know how much he loves you, then you take your life, your <coughs> sin, your mistakes, your past, your guilt, your insecurity, your fears, your regrets, and you hand those to Jesus. And in return, Jesus gives you everything. He gives you love, grace, mercy, forgiveness, and a place in his family. He wants to take your old life, convert it, and give you something new. Here's what I want to do. Everybody close your eyes. Band can come forward now. I know you got a big day ahead. We got a lot going on today, but I just want you to close your eyes. Just for the final five to six minutes here. I 
want you, I want to invite you right now to change. To change something. If you, if you know you're a Christian, maybe it's starting to change what we talked about last night. Applying knowledge to action. And you might have a habit that you know isn't serving you well in your relationship with, life, in your relationship with Jesus. And you're like, today, I'm not doing that. Today, I'm not participating in that conversation. Today, I'm evaluating this relationship. Today, I'm not looking at this thing on my phone. Today, I'm applying truth to action. For some of you, it might actually be convert. Cross over to go from death to life, switching sides, going from selfish to salvation, from sin to savior. And you can do that right now by repenting of your sin and believing in Jesus Christ alone. It's like, if you want to be saved right now, you're going to play games later. You don't need to play games with Jesus right now. You want to be serious about what it means to follow Jesus. And if you're kind of tired of being confused or you're in this haze, like, I don't really know, kind of feel like I'm straddling the fence, you wonder if you're going to heaven or hell when you die, but you can nail that down right now. Jesus loves you, he will forgive you, and he will save you, but you have to ask. So Lord, I ask you right now that your spirit would draw any heart in this room that has never converted to Jesus. But I ask you, Holy Spirit, right now that you would grab a hold of every heart that needs to be saved, every heart that needs to be changed, and every heart that needs to grow closer to you. God, we acknowledge your presence, and we ask you to save for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen.